with us tonight. Welcome to the City Council meeting. We're sorry it's so cold in here. If you're cold, there was a boiler emergency and they just turned the heat on a few minutes ago, I think. So uh, bear with us. Uh, we will we'll begin, as always, with our Pledge of Allegiance, if you'll join me in standing. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, we thank you for coming out tonight. We always review the standards of conduct at the beginning of the meeting um, in welcoming you out. We appreciate that you've taken time to attend and be a part of your local democracy. Uh, we have some guidelines for decorum and civility just to make sure everyone feels welcome giving us their opinion, no matter where you are on the spectrum. Um, please be respectful during other people's comments. Avoid cheering or jeering it usually causes others to feel intimidated. Please also help us take care of this historic meeting room. It's the only meeting room left in this entire building that's still used for its original intended purposes of lawmaking. Uh, the state legislature made it, met in here while the Capitol was under construction. So it is very historic. Please don't stand on the chairs. You don't look like that kind of crowd, but you never know. Um, respect the portrait and the artwork in here. If you have a sign, prop or other piece of equipment like video equipment or otherwise, please make sure it doesn't cause a disruption or block anyone's views. Um, and if you have any items like sticks or dowels, those aren't allowed in this room. Please don't approach the dais. If you have a piece of paper or some materials you want the council to have, uh, raise your hand and the, our staff, staff will you raise your hands? They'll come and grab whatever materials and distribute it to us because you get two minutes to speak during any of our public comment and we don't want you to take that time having to distribute things. We'll do that for you. Our staff is here to help you if you need assistance with anything else or you have any questions about the process. Even during the meeting, raise your hand and they'll come and, and do their best to answer your question. And we can always uh, have that, a bigger conversation in the hallway with staff if you need to. We also recognize that two minutes of comment time probably isn't enough to get out everything that you'd like to share with us. And so we have many other ways for you to share longer thoughts um, from email to the council comments, which all of us receive. Um, there's phone recordings. We collect all of this information, comments from you, and all of us consume it from all of these formats. So go to slccouncil.com to learn about other ways to get a hold of us. And with that, we'll move on to our first item of business, which is approval of the minutes for Tuesday, August 21st, 2018, and the formal meeting minutes for September 18th of 2018. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Johnston, a second by Councilmember Wharton. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. Um, I failed to excuse Councilmember Fowler, who is out of town tonight. That moves us on to the public hearing section B of our agenda. Our very first one, B1, is a resolution for the revised public benefits analysis for a donation to the Homeless Resource Center. And I don't have any cards on this item. Is there anyone here who wants to speak to us about this public, public benefit analysis? Raise your hand. And if not, I'll look for a motion. Madam Chair, I move the council close the public hearing and refer this action, this item for an action as part of the budget amendment number one of fiscal year 2019. Second. I got a motion by Councilmember Rogers, a second by Councilmember Luke. Any discussion on this one? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That one passes. Councilmember Rogers, will you pull your mic up next time for me, please? Yep. We're on to item two, a resolution for the capital improvement program projects. And I do, I've got a stack of cards here on this one, so I'm glad you came out for this. We're gonna start with my old friend Lloyd Cox, followed by Mike Mitchell. Um, and I'll always call two names. The second person, just be ready to come up if you can, immediately following the first person. Lloyd, come on up and give us your comments. Mike, be ready to go afterward. Thank you very much. Do you mind if I adjust? We appreciate you if you pull the mic okay? up. <laughs> I um, just wanted to read the results of a survey I conducted in January. Um, the CIP proposal for the 
lane realignment on 17th South from State Street to 3rd West uh, was submitted and then a month later was announced to the Community Council and I just wanted to make a point of that. Um, a month or two later in January, I felt that there had been no public input and so I personally called the property owners on 17th South and asked for their input. And uh, I, I had quite a few responses. Hudson Printing Company said no. Six states distributors said no. Industrial Supply uh, left a lengthy message basically saying no. Uh, Russ, uh, Lynn Russ Aluminum uh, said no. In fact, he uh, used quite a few adjectives. Uh, fastener Engineer Sales, uh, absolutely no. Uh, same day express dry cleaners, uh, absolutely no. Uh, Transwest Credit Union said no. Uh, I didn't hear back from uh, Sweet Lakes. Uh, Chartway Federal Credit Union uh, was not available. Uh, Pain of Power Company said no. Uh, very busy and they, they their business like, uh, I should also mention the uh, the dry cleaners is very dependent on that business and if the, they're quite concerned that if the traffic was slowed that they would, uh, their business would definitely suffer great, greatly from that. Um, uh, let's see, JJ Potts said no, Legrand Distributing and uh, Time. The, the ceramic said they would be approved, they would uh, we would like to have it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Mike Mitchell up next, followed by Perry Franson. Good evening. My name is Mike Mitchell. I'm representing the board of the Capitol Hill Neighborhood Council regarding two proposals that we submitted to you. One is for sidewalks on 300 North. The major portion is from Almond to Quince. At, that, at this point in time, there is no sidewalks on 300 North that, uh, going up or down the hill. This is on a student neighborhood access program route for kids walking to and from Washington Elementary and West High School. And it is a very narrow street on a steep incline and you've got kids walking in the street along with buses, vehicles, and everything else. Our other, pro our other proposal is for crosswalks on 500 North behind the Capitol. The main point here is that there are certain times during the year when the Capitol gets flooded with people, usually during the legislative session, and parking in the neighborhood is tough to come by, and there are no crosswalks across 500 North to get to the Capitol, so there's a ton of jaywalking going on. It wouldn't be a bad idea to add sidewalks on the north side of 500 North as well to encourage people to cross either at East Capitol or as you see on the, the map you were handed, mid-block. This would help in relieving a lot of the, the hazards, especially during the winter months with people trying to get across for the legislative session. Also, East Capitol is the way to access for a lot of people to walk to Ensign Peak, which is the number one hike in Salt Lake City. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Perry Franson will be followed by Taylor Anderson. So I'm Perry Franson, and, the, and my project um, application is the 11th East Curb and Gutter application. I'm the uh, co-owner of the building at 1945 South, 1100 East. Uh, this project is, in, is intended to solve three problems with existing curb and drive approach and asphalt improvements. Number one, align the curb which was displaced into the asphalt by up to six inches that's, called several, that's caused several blown tires at the curb. Two, correct the curb flow line so that uh, the drainage of the constant standing water from runoff and sprinkler systems will not create a pond in front of the building. And three, fix the existing drive approach apron on the north parking lot exit 
of the Sugar House Post Office, which when installed created the uh, dam, which also created the, the ponding in front of the buildings. The benefits to the public are, number one, increased safety for automobiles, traffic, and parking. Two, elimination of ice dams into the street. And obviously, uh, when we have ice dams, we've got uh, slip and fall uh, liabilities. And number three, eliminate the odor of constant standing water and breakdown of organic material and mosquito breeding in the area caused by the dam. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Franson. Taylor Anderson will be followed by Sarah Bennett. Hey again, everybody. Um, you heard from some of the businesses that don't want the 1700 South lane change. Some of them that do uh, Sweet Lake, Biscuits and Limeade, uh, Friar Tuck Barbershop, Manny's Deli, um, a couple of the housing developers there, uh, the Salt Lake City Bike Advisory Committee, Bike Utah, Cycling Utah. The city's own uh, sustainability department says it will decrease pollution, which I think is a good thing. Uh, the city uh, also says that it will be safer for people on foot and on bikes. Um, I'll also note that UDOT, UDOT traffic counts show that uh, traffic on 17th South is the exact same today as it was in 2005. Um, so at first I saw this as kind of a bike project, but with the businesses that I've talked to, some of the residents that you'll hear from and some of the businesses that'll come speak for themselves, it's an economic development project, it's a clim climate friendly project, it's a bike friendly and ped friendly project. I think you guys should vote in favor of it either tonight or as soon as you can. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Sarah Bennett is up next, followed by Sally Barclaw. Good evening. Thanks for hearing me tonight. My name is Sarah Bennett. I'm Executive Director of Trails Utah. Uh, with help from the Eccles Foundation, we facilitated almost a year's worth of meetings to uh, bring a vision and a consensus to the Salt Lake City Foothills Trail System Project. Um, that was involved the university, the Arboretum, the Natural History Museum, neighborhoods from the area, land managers. We really feel like this was a thorough process and the plan that came out that was uh, produced by Alta Planning and your guys' people over at Salt Lake City Parks and Public Lands did an outstanding job. That plan is really um, something to behold and it will do so much that is needed towards better managing the foothills natural area behind the university between the mouth of immigration going north to davis county um, this area has long been undermanaged and uh, really needs this project and i encourage you to support it and fund it thank you thank you ms bennett sally barclaw Please correct me if I'm saying your name wrong, Sally, followed by Ben Burdett. It's Sally Bearclough, but that's Bear okay. Clough. Thank I've you, been Sally. called Bearclaw a lot. <laughs> um, I'm from the Imperial Neighborhood Park Association, and for those of you who might not be aware, Imperial Neighborhood Park is one of the newest parks in Salt Lake City, um, and we had a ribbon cutting on it. I think Charlie Luke was there about three years ago. Um, the trees in the park are very, very small, very beginner trees, and so the playground, of course, gets extremely hot in the summer, and we have more and more days every summer now that are over 90 degrees, and so the playground equipment is actually almost unsafe to play on without any shade. And so this association had raised a lot of funding before the park was even completed and um, have been waiting for just the right project to spend that money on. And so we put in a CIP application this fall, last fall, for shade structures for the playground. And the Imperial Neighborhood Park Association is willing to match $30,000 toward this project. And we're very proud of that. It took a lot of fundraising to come up with that kind of money. Um, a lot of root beer floats and book sales and um, private donations. So we hope you'll strongly consider um, finishing those shade sales for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barclough. It's definitely something to be proud of. Ben Burdett up next, followed by Karen Sharp. Just with a follow on to what Sally had to say for the same project, shade structures for the Imperial Neighborhood Park, we do have a number of people who are using that park, uh, both 
in the immediate neighborhood as well as from uh, surrounding neighborhoods and they have all uh, complained about the same kinds of things, the lack of shade in the uh, heat of the summer on the playground equipment. Some of the equipment is metal, some of it is not, and definitely the metal equipment definitely needs it, but uh, the other equipment does as well. So uh, as Sally has said, we have raised a considerable amount of money through fundraising projects and so on over the years, and so we feel that this should be a a, uh, a, a good move for the city to enhance this, this neighborhood park. It's become a very popular park in the neighborhood, and so we would like to increase the uh, availability of use of this, even on the hottest days. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burdett. Karen Sharp will be followed by Jacob Shirley. Hi, I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, Whitlock Avenue sidewalks, gutters, and curb project. Um, one of the things that we, we find within our neighborhood is the degradation of the infrastructure. Um, I have a husband who's in a wheelchair, and we have some, you know, issues trying to get the wheelchair on through the sidewalks, out into the street, and believe it or not, the street's probably the safest place for him to be and the safest place for us to push him. I think it would be a benefit to all of the community to have, you know, the sidewalks repaired, to have the gutters and curbs in to help with flooding, to help with also just aligning the street. We've got people parked everywhere. Some of us have created our own gutter, our own curbs. Some people are parked on grass. So I think it would be nice and helpful to have it kind of all aligned, make the community look a little bit better. We are the only street in that neighborhood without these uh, kinds of uh, enhancements. I want to thank you very much for your time and I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. Uh, Jacob Shirley is up, followed by Jenny Shirley. My name is Jacob Shirley. I'm here in support of the Whitlock project for curb and gutter. Um, I have a couple concerns. My main concern is similar to Karen's. Um, we have several um, aging um, residents and some with different levels of abilities. Um, it's actually been a, a couple injuries on the street recently, and so people have had a really difficult time uh, being mobile outside their homes, and the, the edges of our streets are crumbling, they're falling apart, uh, to the point that, you know, every winter the snow plow comes through and it digs up more road, and I'm fully aware of this, because every time I mow my lawn in the spring, I have to pull the street out of my lawn just to make sure I don't damage my lawn mower. Um, Recently, we had the uh, the city come through and try to patchwork a few spots, and my my wife said she overheard one of the workers just say, "You know, it's it's the whole street," and they left, and the the street's still a, a huge mess. Um, I'm I'm concerned a little bit for my own safety too. The the street in front of my house, along the edge, is in uh, it's in such a crumbling shape that when I come home, I, I drive a scooter or a bicycle, and I, I just figure it's just uh, one of these days I'm going to slip out on one of the potholes or the, the pile of gravel that's sitting out there. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shirley. Jenny Shirley is up next, followed by Paul Svensson. Hi. Thanks for having us. Obviously, I'm also in support of the Whitlock improvements. Um, as he mentioned, the asphalt is crumbling. There's also an um, elevation change between the asphalt and the sidewalk. So the sidewalk is actually lower than the asphalt. Um, so everything that runs off the asphalt goes onto the sidewalk. And so when it rains, it actually turns into kind of a river. So um, it just, it literally looks like a river. I think we submitted a video and a bunch of pictures to the file um, with our application. So you can see those. Um, but when it when the river flows <laughs> and you kayak down the river, you can actually end up in what are lakes at the end of everyone's driveways. Um, <laughs> so we actually find that ducks actually come and habitate the lakes every year. <laughs> so that should paint a little bit of a picture. Um, the other problem we have is in the cold months, um, that pooled water actually ices over. And we tried to sp spread ice melt um, as best we can, but it's kind of a temporary fix. Um, so it's kind of a safety concern for us. 
um, in the warmer months, the vegetation, the dirt, and the organic material is spread onto the sidewalk, and we have to go out and dig out um, because the um, sidewalk is actually uneven, so it just creates ruts and weeds start to grow out there. Um, so it'd be really great if we had that leveled and had some way to divert the water with the curb and gutter um, and even things out. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shirley. Paul Svensson is up next, followed by Matt Davis. Thank you. Uh, Paul Svensson, I'm here to speak on uh, in favor of the 17th South Lane realignment. Um, I own three properties that are directly in the middle of uh, the proposed work, two more that are within two blocks. Uh, I'm strongly in support of the proposal. I think there's virtually nothing the, count, uh, the council could do that would benefit the neighborhood more. Um, something that I think has gotten lost a little bit during the conversation about this proposal is how dramatically this neighborhood is changing right now. There are 75 uh, townhouse units under construction right now. And there are another 75 uh, that are in various stages of either permitting or contracting. I mean, so this neighborhood is in the midst of an incredible organic uh, building boom. And a year or 18 months from now, the neighborhood's going to be really dramatically different than it is now. And the question is, how do we want it to be? And I think there are a couple of options. One is that it could end up being something like what we see in places like South Salt Lake or North Salt Lake, um, where we have a very dense uh, middle income housing that's built on very busy streets. It's a flyby kind of place, a kind of place to rest your head at night, but not much more than that. Um, and there's a place in the world for those, but I think in this location and in Salt Lake City, I think we can do better, uh, particularly because we have this really exciting little group of retail uh, businesses that are growing there, places like Sweet Lake Biscuits and Manny's and Foteha. I mean, there are a lot. It, it, it's a neighborhood that's really dynamic already and getting better. The alternative is to have a little mini ninth and ninth. And I think this proposal takes us one big step toward that. And I Time. hope you'll consider it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Svensson. Matt Davis is up next. And Matt will be followed by Christopher Davis. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm representing the 19th East uh, Neighbors Committee. Um, what we're asking for is about 820 feet of concrete uh, and uh, two traffic calming devices. Um, we have three reasons why we're asking for these. Uh, one is water safety. Um, a year ago, uh, last July, there was the, uh, the urban flooding event in Salt Lake. Um, we were, uh, along with five houses on our street, we were one of the worst hit. We had uh, 17 gallon, 17,000 gallons of water come into our home. That's the uh, size of a backyard swimming pool. And it came in with such force that it blew apart a window, blew off a dead bolted door from the inside across an atrium, uh, blew an internal door across our living room downstairs, broke an, a window from the inside and left us with four and a half feet of standing water and mud. Um, in the uh, TV room where it was four and a half feet deep and came in with that force, our kids often sleep down there. Luckily they were not there because I wouldn't want to see what would have happened. Uh, in addition, my, uh, my wife, who's sitting right there and is an artist, her life's work was destroyed uh, because that's where her studio was. Um, while the news said this was a 200-year event, uh, for us, the, uh, the severity of it was scary and unprecedented, but um, unfortunately, the flooding is not um, a very unusual event on our street. Um, when touring the damage with the media, multiple officials from the city told us that our street was not designed correctly. Uh, and uh, with climate change, we're going to get more extreme events. In fact, last um, um, week we had uh, 1.8 inches of water fall on our house. Um, and uh, so importantly, the city has been very responsive, your water department. They've redone the sewer, or the stormwater, I should say. 
uh, but they have not redone the surface of the street, and so it still, still curves and goes into uh, our yard. And so we'd appreciate uh, if you could take care of that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis, before you go, I didn't have your address on here. Am I assuming you live on 19th East? Thanks. Okay, Christopher Davis is up next, followed by Scott Schaefer. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm here in support for the bike lane between State Street and 3rd West. I'm a homeowner on 200 East, and I frequently cycle back and forth between home and the Rock Gym on 300 West, which that street is a problem of its own. Trying to bike down that is a death trap. Um, no need for hyperbole, sorry. But as a casual cyclist who's enjoyed cycling in places such as Chicago, uh, the District of Columbia, and Boston, I see that Salt Lake does a lot of things as well as, if not better, than most of those cities. Uh, we have a lot of protected bike lanes, a lot of uh, protected turning lanes, and we're doing things really well in that way. Uh, but there are areas of town that are neglected, so trying to get from one of those areas to the next is uh, often not the most enjoyable experience for other casual cyclists. Uh, and, and we just want people to feel safe enough to uh, bike to get groceries or not have to be a serious cyclist in order to get around. Uh, so I believe that this area would be perfect as a central area to build here and then work out from there. And uh, it would allow us to get around a little more easily. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Scott Schaefer's up next, followed by Don Curtis. Hello, my name's Scott Schaefer. Um, I am here in support of the Lindsay Gardens Concession and Pedestrian Access Project. I'm the president of Avenues Baseball. We are a community-based nonprofit that operates fall and spring baseball leagues for boys and girls in the Avenues neighborhood. We play our games at Lindsay Gardens. It's a spectacular park, and we're proud to partner with uh, the Parks Department. To support that park, we've donated more than $15,000 in improvements over the last few years, and another 10 are coming shortly. The park is beautiful, but we do have some suggestions for improvement. Number one uh, in our CIP is we're suggesting that the city look at ways to improve pedestrian access. If you've been to that park, there are three baseball fields, and the elevation change between them is dramatic. There are no stairs, and so walking up and down these very steep hills, carrying baseball equipment, as I have been known to do, um, it's dangerous, and uh, it would be easier for our parents to get around and grandparents with better access. Uh, we're also asking for improved concession facilities at our ballpark. Um, the concession stands that we have are very old and not up to the same standards as you have at other ballparks in the city, such as Herman Franks and Poplar Grove. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Don Curtis is up. I'm I'll hold on to it. Thanks, Dan. Uh, John Knobloch. Knobloch. You'll have to f f uh, forgive me and correct me. Oh, good. All right. Followed by Dave Iltis. Hey, I'm uh, John Knobloch. I'm the co-chair of the Bonneville Shoreline Trail Committee. And I'm talking uh, here to ask for your support of the Foothills Trail Project. Uh, the Bonneville Shoreline Trail, as you may know, is one of the first to real design trails across the foothills. Most of the trails that we have in the foothills are user-created goat paths or old jeep trails. And uh, the Salt Lake County Parks and Rec folks did a survey a couple of years ago. They've done two, in fact, that showed that uh, trails, recreational trails, is the number one uh, desired public amenity. The, the Salt Lake City trails are very well loved. Tons of people are out there. In fact, there's so many pe people out there sometimes it looks like Zion or Yosemite National Park. It'll just be a constant stream of people. So uh, consequently, there's a need to have improved trails. Some of the trails are these user-created goat paths that go straight up the hills and are damaging the environment, causing erosion and runoff. So, so uh, other trails like Dry Fork, uh, you have tight blind corners and mixed use of bikes and hikers, and it's so busy it's getting to be dangerous through some of those areas. So approving the trails plan and funding the trails plan is very important for the community 
to improve recreation uh, so that it's safe and fun and good for people's physical and mental health and also good for the environment. So I urge you to support funding the Foothills Trail Project. Thank you, Thanks. Mr. Noblock. Dave Iltis is up next, followed by George Chapman. Hi, my name is Dave Eltis with Cycling Utah. Um, first thing is, this is a great array of projects that you have on there. Um, they look like, for the most part, all of them will help um, make the city a better place, and I think the, the list is really a, a top-notch list. Um, I wanted to speak in favor of most or all of the bicycling projects that you have a, a number of them on here, um, particularly the Trails Plan in 1700 South. Uh, the Trails Plan, um, I'm going to echo what John Knobloch and Sarah Bennett had to say that it is um, sorely needed in the foothills um, both to uh, reduce environmental impacts and also provide uh, conflict-free places for bikers and hikers to go. Um, I would request, though, with the trails plan that you use all of the $340,000 available in impact fees. Salt Lake has done a dreadful job in using impact fees, and according to the CIP PDF that was online, there's $340,000 available for this. I don't understand why you're not using the full amount of that and jump-starting the trails plan. Um, second thing on the 1700 South improvements, um, please do uh, work um, vote for yes for this, but um, it would be great to see a protected bike lane, a parking protected bike lane as part of this, as well as extending the area to 200 east because the traffic lane configuration um, makes it so that you don't need um, two lanes on the eastbound section of 1700 south east of State Street. Um, transportation plan update is fantastic. Please do that. Um, complete streets enhancements are great, but please update your ordinance so that you don't have to and shouldn't be spending money through CIP on enhancements. They should be included from the beginning, say on 900 West. Uh, please require bike lanes on 1300 East. Um, it's not clear from the um, from the CIP project Time. or the engineering, and lastly, please require facil bike facilities on the 700 South Bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Iltis. George Chapman is up next, followed by Michael Clara. Good evening. I'm against the 17 South Road dot because you've actually polarized the whole neighborhood. The number 10 rule of good government is you don't polarize neighborhoods. 50% according to the survey are for it, 50% are against it. Congratulations. Obviously, you should not do the road dot. Now, I understand all the issues involved, and I know why some of the people want to have it, but I think in bicycling terms, putting in parking and reducing travel lanes actually will make it more dangerous for bicyclists, in my opinion. You're also going to increase pollution with all the extra building in the area, and there's a train tracks. The road diet manual says you're supposed to consider train tracks, but that was not considered in the 17 South road diet consideration or planning. And I remind you what happened on 900 West. They did not consider train tracks, and they did it without full community involvement, and they got a big increase in accidents. Uh, the number one rule, according to the book, of road dots is make sure everyone is involved and supports it. So that's one reason why you shouldn't do it. Andrew on the Three Creeks Confluence, I don't understand why you're even thinking of spending $1.4 million to daylight a creek when they can go 100 feet away and see all the river they could ever want. Um, the maintenance yard, no. And the 11th East Project, I think you should make a comment about the agreement from last week that pointed out the 11th East is an alternate route for the mother of all projects, the 13th East Road Project. And if you do any project on 11th East, you're destroying the whole neighborhood, increasing pollution. The world's going to end. Please don't do it. Thanks for listening. Thank you, as always, Mr. Chapman. Michael Clare, you're up next, followed by Katie Cox. So um, my name is Michael Clara, 
And I just wanted to talk or, or, or sound a warning about the road diets, and I uh, have a handout that I wanted to, sorry that they're almost close to the same color, but I'll just walk through these until I run out of time. But if you look at this darker one, there's two of them. If you look at the darker colored one, it's titled 900 West uh, uh, Debacle. And what's happened is in Salt Lake, in, on 900 West, we had a road diet put in about a year ago. And over here on the front page, it says that transportation on their web page, they said that it was intended to increase safety uh, by up 19 to 29%. And what we found was, if you turn the page over, as we were on the bottom here, there's a graph that shows the data that we were collecting showing that the accidents actually uh, increase exponentially. Um, the, 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 on social media, Salt Lake Transportation says, based on crash data, we have pulled from reported uh, crashes to Salt Lake City Police Department. The numbers are lower than 2016, 2015. That was earlier this year. Um, and so we continued to do grammar requests and we were able to determined that that was a lie, that there was no truth to that whatsoever. And on this lighter yellow one on the back, there's a graph. This is a graph that just went up two weeks ago by Salt Lake uh, Transportation Division confirming what we were uh, saying all this time. And so the concern is that we have found, the other thing is they won't meet with us. We're, uh, the, we've asked the mayor's office to, to have them meet with us next month. And um, we just, they just flat out won't meet with us. So it's disingenuous that they impose this on, the, on, on, a, on a community and then won't even have a discussion with us about it. Um, and, and I wanna publicly thank uh, Councilman Johnson. He's come to a couple of the meetings where residents have, um, uh, have expressed concern and he's listened to, to our concerns and he's familiar with, with these concerns. So I would just urge the council that at least require a basic uh, analysis or feasibility study from transportation Time. division before they implement road diets in other parts of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clara. Katie Cox is up next, followed by Kevin Dwyer. Hi, um, my name is Katie. I'm a resident of Whitlock Avenue. Uh, so I am speaking on behalf of the um, funding for street improvements. Um, my neighbors have painted a vivid picture um, of the difficulties that we experience on our street, um, including uh, flooding, freezing, river-like effects, um, crumbling streets, broken sidewalks, mobility issues. We have a host of, of problems. We're on the edge of Sugar House. We're a walking uh, street, a walking neighborhood, and it's really important to us to be able to navigate our neighborhood um, in a safe and accessible way. Um, I just like to say um, it's it's really important to all of us to you know have safe, accessible sidewalks um, for both our, our the residents on our street and the larger community. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Kevin Dwyer is the last card I have. Come on up, Kevin. And if you still want to speak or you've been inspired to speak tonight, let's admit it. Somebody out there wants to speak who hasn't given me a card. Raise your hand, and Cindy Lou will bring you a card, and we can get you up here. Kevin, go ahead. Thank you. I'm Kevin Dwyer, and I'm with the Salt Lake Valley Trail Society. We are your county's mountain bike trails group. I want to encourage you all to support the Foothill Trails Master Plan through CIP funding. It's a tremendous opportunity to uh, leverage the good work that's been done by the city parks and open space, as well as a um, variety of different trail groups here in the valley, including our group and the Bonneville Shoreline Trail Commission. Um, who are prepared to help implement that plan and provide for the ongoing maintenance of it. Uh, we, our group, uh, the Trail Society, currently stewards four different trail areas here in Salt Lake, and we're looking to expand that program uh, to other trail areas as well as to assist the city in building new trails. And as uh, some of the previous speakers mentioned, trails are the number one most requested recreational amenity for Salt Lake County residents. Really encourage your support of this and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer. Anyone? Going once, going twice. I'll look for a motion. Madam Chair, I move that the council close the public hearing, suspend the rules, and approve a resolution adopting the capital improvement program allocations for fiscal year 2018-2019, as shown on the attached funding log, except for project number three, so that the city can review funding options and process with the Inland Port Board. And I also move that we approve the following contingent appropriation for Project 50, uh, which is a $265,000 uh, appropriation is contingent upon the 
administration sending to the council a determination of the eligibility to use parks and or streets impact fees for the project. If any impact fees can be used, then the council intends in a budget amendment to swap out impact fees for an equal amount of general fund dollars, which will be recaptured into the CIP cost overrun account. Second. Think, will you just mention which project that is? Uh, yeah, I was going to do that in my comments. Okay. So, um, but we have a second, so. Can I've got a motion by Councilmember Luke and a second by Councilmember Kitchen. Okay. Discussion. So, yeah. So um, on that uh, project number fifty is the Sunnyside Nine Line Trail uh, to the Matheson Nature Preserve. Uh, this was an item that um, was brought forward by the community, which uh, will just fund an additional portion of. The Nine Line uh, Trail, which uh, eventually will uh, connect the Jordan River to Emigration Canyon and the Foothill uh, Trail System. Other discussion, Councilmember Kitchen. Uh, thank you, Councilmember uh, Luke and Mendenhall, for this. Um, I, I I obviously support this with my second, um, but I, I would like to add that as the administration is looking at the eligibility for impact fees, that they also contemplate a long-range funding and design um, scenario for the nine line. Um, it's clear to me after a couple conversations with constituents over in the Central Ninth neighborhood, which will also need to accommodate the nine line trail, uh, that there is maybe some miscommunication or misunderstanding between some of our city departments on the nine line. I'm thinking of engineering, parks, and transportation. Um, so I would request that we also get um, some language in that uh, proposal from the administration as well. Other discussion? I want to mention that uh, the council, as probably, I hope many of you know, we don't do our debating in this room. This is the culmination of uh, five or six weeks of debate that we've been having across the hall in the work session room, which we do on Tuesdays at 2 o'clock. And that is open to the public. You can also um, spend quality time watching it on television on Channel 17 in Salt Lake City. So we uh, have held briefings on this September 4th, 11th, 8th, 18th, sorry, October 2nd, October 9th. Um, and we've been debating these issues. So while uh, I wasn't sure if we'd have a motion to adopt tonight, um, this it, we definitely have coalesced our, our debates on this. and and know where we're at on most of these items. So I invite you to take part in the listening part of those debates next year if you didn't already this year. Is there any other discussion on the motion that's on the table before we vote? Okay, all those in favor, aye. 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 And any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you for coming out to that public hearing and please stick around if you want. We've got more fun with an ordinance for a street closure at 1100 West between 900 South and Hayes Avenue. Right. I want to mention before you go that if you have specific questions about what we just passed and what was funded, funded that I, uh, I'm going to ask our staff to step outside in the hallway and can help direct you to what just happened exactly. So I don't have Oh, I do. I do. I have one. Michael Clara would like to speak to us on the street closure at 1100 West. Come on up. Thank you. Why don't we just take a second? Okay. You ready? Ready. Okay. Now we'll start the clock. So I think I have another handout that's a white paper. And um, I also, you have a green paper that I'll refer to in a second. But I'm a po I live uh, three blocks from the closure and I'm opposed to it uh, as a number of the neighbors are in that area and that I knew they couldn't make it tonight. But one of the, the concerns that we have is that when you read the report um, by the uh, uh, planning department or the staff report, it, it, it mentions a lot about safety, that it's going to enhance safety. But those, that, those of us that live in that area don't believe that that's going to be the case because right now, for example, there's camping going on in the um, open, uh, open spaces of Salt Lake City, and that just puts the open space closer to the homes. Already in that particular area because of the nine line, uh, people are having, like during the day, 
um, strangers are walking in people's homes and, and they're coming from the urban camping that's going on uh, near the river. So that's one concern. The other concern in this green paper, just a block away from that, um, uh, in violation of Salt Lake City ordinance, there is a cell tower in the middle of a residential area. The mayor's office and the city have now, just recently in the last three months, have acknowledged that it's illegal and it shouldn't be there. And so we'd like to see that resolved and taken care of. Uh, city ordinance says that you can't have uh, a cell tower in a residential area no greater than 30 inches in diameter. This is six feet, 11 inches. And when we first complained last year to the planning department and to zoning, they claimed that it was in, uh, in, in compliance with ordinance, which, which was just a lie. And so, so we'd like to see that taken care of. Uh, the other issue is that in the report, it says that there's low traffic going through the street area. So why close it? Um, and, and what's going to happen is, again, if you close it to vehicular traffic that they already claim is low, and they're trying to make it safer for pedestrians, I would ask that you guys as policymaker ask it safer than what? Like, do we have a lot of uh, pedestrians getting killed there? And now we're going to make it safer. And you'll find that there are no... There were no accidents or injuries in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clare. I have a card from Dave Iltis. And Dave's is the last card I have on this item. Um, my name's Dave Iltis. I wanted to speak in favor of the street closure. Um, the Nine Line Trail is an incredibly important uh, cross valley corridor. Um, and whatever you can do to improve the conditions on the Nine Line Trail, as well as improve trails and alternatives to uh, getting to, to streets in Salt Lake City is really important. So I ask that you um, please do approve this street closure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Iltis. Is there anyone who wants to speak to us on this item? Okay, then I'll look for a motion. Madam Chair. I, I move that the council close the public hearing and defer action to a future council meeting. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Johnston, a second by Councilmember Wharton. Any discussion on this one? Uh, yeah, just to clarify. So I know uh, Michael Claren, uh, we've talked about the cell tower with the administration. It's a different issue than this completely, but it is being handled uh, through the appropriate channels, I believe, at this point. So if you need an update, let's get some tonight. Or tap. Thank you, Councilmember. Anything else? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And we've closed that public hearing. Uh, that takes us on to ADUs, I believe, but let me catch up in my agenda. Yes, our ordinance around accessory dwelling unit amendments. And I do have a stack of cards. Nancy Saxton is up first, followed by Jim Webster. All right, thank you for being here. Jim Webster, I believe you do want to speak and you'll be followed by Clayton Morgan. Yeah, Jim Webster, Yale Chris, Neighborhood Council. I live on uh, Military Drive, I'm 938 here. Military Drive. Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of amazed that, you know, you had an ordinance that uh, dealt with uh, Parking. It dealt with a lot of other issues. It was an incentive for. Will you grab to that live. mic like a rock star? <laughs> Thank okay? you. Thanks. We couldn't hear you very well. Oh, I'll, can I start over? Anyway, you had an ordinance that dealt with uh, environmental issues. You, with you had light rail uh, incentives. You had parking issues. There was just a whole lot of things that were dealt with that are now being stricken. And uh, you just like throwing out the baby with the bathwater in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm a consultant to developers. I've done, I don't know, maybe 15, 20,000 units of apartments, none at the present time, thank goodness. But anyway, uh, we would normally assume that, and James, you can correct me on these numbers, but I think I'm right, uh, in terms of cost per square foot to develop an apartment unit you're down around 55 to $70. For me, for instance, to develop an ADU as a separate unit in my backyard, I would be up to about 160 to nearly $200. That would mean if you were to translate the rent of $1,200 for apartments that is kind of the going rate in Salt Lake City, it would be $3,500 a month if you had that same 
uh, cover your cost of development. And so I don't think it's feasible. Maybe it'll happen anyway, and I think you probably do have the votes, except for Charlie. Uh, but I think it's really half-baked, and I think it really needs to be thought out in much greater detail. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Clayton Morgan, you're up next, followed by Cindy Cromer. Hi, Council Members. Uh, Clayton Morgan. I'm in the Yale Crest neighborhood, and uh, I would like to express my strong support for this ordinance. I believe it is well thought out. Uh, there are, of course, improvements that could be made that I think can be adjusted uh, with time. Um, I am not concerned about overpopulation or um, an exceeding amount of additional dwelling units. I think that the design standards, the square footage requirements, uh, the up, uh, updated zoning and codes and building codes uh, will limit how many people are able to do this. But in my case, it will give me an option uh, to use part of my backyard as a potential uh, dwelling unit for my aging mother, which otherwise we would have to pay rent or get an apartment somewhere else, and then we would have to travel to go and help her out. So um, I think it's long overdue. I think it's, uh, it should be supported, and I appreciate your work on this, so please support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Cindy Cromer is up next, followed by David Shear. Um, my name is Cindy Cromer. Um, we agree that we have a housing crisis. As a landlord with 40 years of experience, I don't see a clear path out of this crisis. I do know that we cannot, must not, spend as much time on each tool or strategy as we have on this one for accessory dwelling units. We have to move faster and far more efficiently than we have. My forecast is that this ordinance will be similar to the one for off-leash dog parks, especially in complaints generated and failures to enforce. There will, however, be citizens who are pleased, and no one can criticize you for a lack of diligence or a lack of persistence. My request tonight is that you examine the effects of this ordinance after a few years. I'd suggest three. Um, I'm not suggesting a sunset clause, which would be extremely disruptive to people who want to develop ADUs as well as neighborhoods in general. Um, I am suggesting that you request data from planning, permitting, and enforcement before too many years go by. Thank you for your diligence. Thank you for your diligence, Ms. Cromer. Uh, David Shear will be followed by George Chapman. Evening. I'm David Shear. I'm here on behalf of the Capitol Hill Neighborhood Council Board. Um, we wrote a letter to then Council Member Stan Penfold on March 8th, 2017. Um, when this issue was first uh, sent out to the community councils um, for response. Um, we said at the time, and we continue to feel that we support the general idea of ADUs. However, um, a, a problem which we saw at that time and still exists in the ordinance is that as, since these things are going to be permitted uses, community councils will not be notified if there's an application filed um, for an ADU. Um, in the neighborhood that I represent, Marmalade, DeSoto, Cortez, places like this, um, it's very important to have neighborhood input in the decision of whether to allow an ADU on a particular piece of property because they are all unique. Um, parking is always a problem, and um, privacy is always a problem. And since the uh, ordinance requires that ADUs be compatible, with the surrounding, that's, I think, a judgment that really only the neighborhood itself can make. So we would like to have this amended so that in some way, shape, or form, community councils are notified when an ADU application is filed. Um, secondarily, um, I have heard a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence from people in our neighborhood that the city presently lacks the resources to enforce the owner occupancy uh, for the uh, prohibition of short-term rentals as it is. So I would ask, will the city be appropriating more resources to enforce the owner occupancy requirement of this ordinance? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shear. George Chapman is up next, followed by Brian Burnett.
I'm against the ADU ordinance uh, before, now, and forever. I don't think you understand the implications. I'd love to see ADU solve the ho housing problem, but it's not solving the ho housing problem with this kind of an ordinance. You're throwing parking requirements out the window. For the last decade, this council has been fighting back and forth about parking requirements. And you doubled it a few years ago to one per unit for a reason. And now you're throwing it out the window? This doesn't make sense. I agree with Cindy and a couple of the other speakers. You do not have any enforcement mechanism, really, because it takes a year for enforcement right now, and you put in a whole bunch more housing, and you don't increase enforcement. It's like not maintaining the projects you build. And you're, you're, tr you're trying to maintain them. You're talking about funding maintenance, but you're not talking about funding the same thing on an ADU ordinance. This is a threat to the character and the stability of single family home neighborhoods. And more important, single family home neighborhoods, if you can't live in them, you're gonna go out to the suburbs, buy a home there, and use a car to get to Salt Lake City. You're actually increasing pollution if you don't protect single family home neighborhoods in Salt Lake City. Don't pass the ordinance. If you do, you will increase pollution in Salt Lake City. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Brian Burnett is up next, followed by Dave Iltis. After that, Robert Goodman's the last card I have, so if you wanna speak, raise your hand. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, address you and I appreciate all your service. My name is Brian Burnett and I live in District 6. I'm standing and uh, coming before you to oppose this ordinance. I believe that it uh, impacts the character of single family uh, residential neighborhoods. I think that people have a reasonable expectation when they purchase in these neighborhoods that they are, in fact, single family residential neighborhoods. And you're your overlay is proposing to change that. And uh, I've, I've read not all of the 178 pages that you have posted on your website, but I've been through about half of them. And I appreciate all the effort and time you've put in to try to mitigate the, the concerns, but I think, in fact, it, it doesn't get to the basic problem. Uh, it's going to impact adjacent properties. I think the people, once the, the rental units become prevalent, uh, there'll be loss of privacy, parking is a problem. I've noticed there are several exceptions to the rule. Every now and again, I'd like to be able to park in front of my own home. And these are, you know, single driveways. And, it, you know, there's just, I, I don't see the parking issues being adequately addressed. And I think it, it dramatically changes the nature. And I agree with the uh, previous gentleman. Now you want to you encourage families to come in and live here. And they're going to come, they, they, they're here because they like the neighborhoods. Already in my neighborhood, a significant amount of people are sending their children outside of the city for school. So you already got one strike against you to encouraging families to come in. If you suddenly impose uh, this ordinance on top of what has traditionally been a single family residential neighborhood and it starts to become uh, a rental unit area that's not very well maintained and certainly not enforced by the city, um, I, I think that we're just going down the wrong road. I would strongly urge you to reject this. And, um, and, or, if, or if you want to do it, don't do it in my neighborhood. You know? Time. Uh, thank you. Way to go out with a bang, Mr. Burnett. Uh, Dave Iltis, followed by Robert Goodman. Uh, my name's Dave Iltis. I live in the Avenues. Um, I'm very much for this. Uh, I, this is what allowed me to purchase my home and live in the avenues uh, to be able to rent the basement apartment that was there. Um, and I would like to suggest a minor change to the ordinance, which is in the parking waiver requirements, uh, that if the um, unit has on-site bicycle storage, uh, that that be um, either an allow for a waiver if that's the case or make that a requirement if parking is waived to include bicycle storage. Um, I note that you have, um, if you're within one quarter mile of a transit stop, but um, 
you should also require bicycle storage, whether it's in a shed or, you know, on in the in the unit itself. Um, and that's uh, cities such as New York do that with their uh, apartment buildings. And there are many apartment buildings going in um, across the country that are are parking free. And that often is one of the requirements is that bicycle storage be included. So I ask that you amend the ordinance to include that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Iltis. Robert Goodman, you're up next, followed by Sheila, Sheila Od O'Driscoll. Pardon me. Thank you to the council and thank you to the mayor's office. Uh, I'm a homeowner in District 5. Uh, my name is Robert Goodman. Um, I support this uh, uh, ordinance. Um, I was here. Uh, about a year ago, and have you guys been discussing ADUs for quite some time? Uh, you've discussed it extensively, and I think that's fantastic. And uh, I would just like to once again express my support, and uh, once again uh, kind of mention that yeah, we've invested millions in parking, and I think that um, parking is not a concern for me as a homeowner. Uh, lastly. Uh, I would kind of like to share my opinion as to why I'm, uh, I feel so strongly about uh, ADUs. Um, a couple years back, I was a, a college student uh, and I had two, sometimes three jobs. And um, if it wasn't for a ADU with kind of uh, lower than market rate rent, uh, my life would have been um, a lot harder. Um, it really gave me the opportunity to um, excel and achieve my goals. Um, and yeah, after uh, I graduated from college, I got a full-time job, um, uh, paid back all my student loan debt, and uh, about a year later, I bought a house. Uh, so it was uh, uh, having that little window of opportunity uh, was terrific. And I would also say that um, people of that demographic, college students, uh, working jobs, uh, don't necessarily get their voice uh, heard at these types of meetings because uh, they're busy. Uh, so I'd just like to uh, express my support once again, and I'd like to thank the council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodman. Sheila O'Driscoll is my last card. And if anyone would like to speak after Ms. Dris O'Driscoll, please raise your hand and we'll get you a card. Oh, I just wanted to thank all of you. I was here last time we discussed this, that it's nice to come here and have you be respectful towards us and encourage us to be civil towards each other. I appreciate that a great deal. Uh, I served on the community council in Sugar House for about 20 years and saw a whole bunch of things going on in different neighborhoods and different things like that. Um, regardless of what people agree and disagree on in a neighborhood, what I've found that all of them have two things in common, and that is that they want to feel safe where they live, and they want their personal space and their property respected. So I've, I've read all of the comments on Open City Hall. <laughs> I know, it was crazy. I've listened to people, and I really think I, I appreciate the points of view of people who want to um, have your support on this. I still pretty much feel like the way I did last time. I think you can do better. My neighborhood isn't like someone else's, and I do understand the um, aging in place. I have an 86-year-old mother my sister's living with in Arizona to do that, exactly that. I understand the need to provide those things. And I told you the last time I was here, I actually live in a neighborhood that has duplexes that were part of the initial development of the neighborhood, and I happen to own one of the biggest ones there. I understand all these things. I do not think this will provide affordable housing. I think it's going to be very expensive to do, so it's going to limit a lot of people. Um, I think parking is extremely important. It may not be to some people, and it may not be the same in other neighborhoods, but I can tell you, for me in my neighborhood, and the comments I've seen from my neighbors, parking is essential for safety, 
whether you're a pedestrian trying to get in and out of your property, we Time. have numbers of problems. I would encourage you to wait and really address some of the things to do give us a better overall. Thank ordinance. you, Ms. O'Driscoll. That's the final card I have. Raise your hand if you would like to come up and address us on this particular issue. And if not, I'm going to look for a motion. Madam Chair, I move the council close the public hearing, suspend our rules, and adopt this ordinance tonight. Does he have a second? Please. Second. I've got a motion by Councilmember Kitchen and a second by Councilmember Wharton. That wasn't one of the options tonight, guys. <laughs> we weren't going to vote on this tonight. We, but it is our purview to do so, so I respect your motion. Let's have some discussion. Councilmember Kitchen. You know, this was brought up by a number of constituents who spoke on this item. And it's true. We have spent an enormous, an amazing amount of time on this ordinance. And I think we need to pass it tonight and see how it shakes out in our community. And to Cindy's point, come back and revisit this in two or three years and see how, it, how it's taking shape. Um, there are concerns. I feel like we have spent a lot of time invested in this issue um, and trying to address and mitigate all of the concerns that have been brought forward. And I think we have a pretty solid piece of legislation in front of us. Um, there are gaps for sure. Um, and I think that looking back in a couple years from now, we will be able to better address those with a cleanup bill. Um, this will not fix the affordable housing issue in our community, but when we have such a tight housing market, adding any units will inevitably help us bring down rents, even nominally. Um, I appreciate the conversation. I think that we do have a good, good um, uh, ordinance on, at our hands, and uh, I hope we can pass it tonight. So thank you for letting me make a modified motion. Councilmember Luke. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I will be voting against this motion um, and against the ordinance. I agree with Councilmember Kitchen in that we have spent a lot of time talking about this. Uh, I've now been on the City Council for seven years. Uh, we've talked about it every one of those seven years. I spent uh, two years on the Planning Commission prior to uh, serving on the City Council. I spent both years talking about it there. Um, this is, I, have, I have worked on this issue more than I have worked on any other issue that we've been uh, faced with as a city. And after nine years, I still have questions, and I've, this, the administration and the previous administration uh, have not responded as to how this is going to be enforced. This is an unenforceable ordinance. Uh, it is going to, uh, or it has the potential of drastically changing uh, the look and feel of our, uh, of our neighborhoods. Um, I really, really hope that I'm wrong. I hope that, you know, after, uh, you know, if, if this passes, that, uh, that things do move forward and that the problems that I am concerned about uh, do not uh, arise. But when you have an ordinance that is as unenforceable as this is, I have serious, con or serious, serious concerns. Um, I, again, I hope I'm wrong, um, but in nine years, uh, nobody has been able to tell me how this is going to be enforced how it is going to continue to protect uh, the, uh, our neighborhoods that, that we have. Um, and so I'll, I'll be voting against this. Thank you, Councilmember Luke. Uh, Councilmember Johnston. Uh, I'm, I'm in favor, but I'm not in favor of acting tonight. I think I'd like to defer to a future council meeting. So I won't support the current motion, but I'd like to make another motion at the end. And you are welcome to offer a substitute motion or a friendly amendment. I don't know how friendly it is, but I'd like to offer a friendly amendment, Derek. Um, I'd like to close the public hearing, but defer action to a future council meeting. Does he have a second? I'll as, second. As you offered it as a friendly amendment, but it sounds like a substitute motion. I'll second that. Uh, we've got a substitute motion by Councilmember Johnson with a second by Councilmember Rogers. Discussion on this motion. Rogers? No. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm kind of with Councilmember Johnston. I feel like uh, we have a, I just feel like we've been deliberate in our discussions, trying to, to get some answers. And I hate to jump the gun and just saying, let's, let's just go one more and defer it to the next meeting and do what 
I feel like what we've said we were going to do from the beginning. But um, if this fails, I'm still in favor of it, and I'll, I'll vote in favor of the other motion as well. Madam Chair. Yes. To, to the substitute motion uh, and, and the maker of the substitute motion, do you, um, Council Member Johnston, do you intend to bring any changes uh, to the ordinance prior to uh, our, our consideration in next meeting? Any changes I would bring wouldn't be approved, so no. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so no, at this point, no. I think that we just need to follow the process we've agreed to to make sure we're crossing our teeth on it. And with seven of us tonight, if it's three and three, it fails. Is that correct? Six of us. That's what I'm saying. So if this substitute motion fails, then we go to the original motion. Mm -hmm. And if that is a divide, then it fails. We're going to get, we're going to do a straw poll before we <laughs> just <laughs> On the substitute well, motion? Can I just ask a question? Yeah, but, we, um, we can still have discussion, and I would love to hear your positions before we vote. Does anyone on the council intend to submit any changes between now and the next? Okay. I'd be more than happy to submit changes. <laughs> 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 Well, it well, sounds like you had a lot of shots. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's taken us nine years. I pro prolonged this as long as I could. It sounded like longer. Um, it's been a lifetime. <laughs> Anything else, Councilmember Wharton? I, I, I guess I would just say that it, I, we did commit to a public process, but we have held two hearings now, um, and that is the substance of what we committed to was to was to go through the normal process and then to have at least two public formal hearings. Um, I, I think if no, if none of us are intending to submit any changes, um, that, that this isn't like so many other motions that we have where we, I don't think anyone could say that they haven't had time to really chew this over. So. Does the, does the maker of the substitute motion or the second one recall? <laughs> no, I think we, we defer these things because we want to make sure everything's done right, both procedurally and also for the, the text and content and everything is the way it needs to be. So. Well, I, I just want to be clear that it's not improper for us. It's within our purview to suspend the rules and adopt on any, any item that we close a public hearing on. Um, and so it's, it's not an improper path, but I, I didn't put it as one of the motions on here tonight because I just thought we've taken nine years. We might as well have one more, <laughs> one more meeting. Um, and I, I just want to say that the, yeah, the gap that Councilmember Kitchen mentioned in, in some of the ADU um, components isn't for want of research or lack of discussion. I think it's in the nature of such a, a significant shift um, and the opportunity that that creates is one that um, will be illuminated by the experience we'll have as a city, I think, when, when we see this take shape and see it develop. Uh, Madam Chair, in addition to that, I think, uh, I think it was Mr. Chapman, or maybe it was, uh, I think it was George that said something about the price for these ADUs, and ADUs that are gonna be outside of the, the home they are going to be a lot more expensive. We know that. So we know that the, the ADUs that are going to be built first are those that are within inside the home. So I think that'll be, like Cindy Cromer said, I think it's a great way for us to gauge, you know, the types of developments that are being built. The, and the uh, moving forward, I think that we're going to see where that growth is really taking place, which districts it's, it's, they're being built in and then the affordability factor if there is any. So. And I wanted to make a comment. Um, that the affordability component isn't about the ADU itself at all for me. It's about, for me, so many residents I've heard from who, um, speaking to the loss of character and stability in our neighborhoods, the loss of character and stability I hear from so many of District 5 residents and citywide is that people aren't able to age in place when they get onto a fixed income and are costs of living in the city are as uh, as they are across the Wasatch Front are growing um, and they are faced with moving out 
or in, into cheaper accommodations and have come to these discussions over the years we've been having them to say, I've got equity in my home and I want people, I love to build with the equity that I have to create an ADU, be able to age in place and have assistance on the property to help me shovel the snow and take care of things and have that be someone of my choosing. That's what I hear from my residents and that's a different kind of affordability that absolutely gets at values that we hold in this city around maintaining diversity of our residents and allowing people to age in place. So this isn't about cheap apartments that we're going to create overnight that will be affordable in their rent, but it's about people having access to their housing for longer. And it's also, I think, when we another speaker talked about encouraging families into the city. Um, as we heard from another speaker and many others before him tonight, and, and my own family, um, the opportunity of ADUs as it's played out across the country is very much about, in fact, a majority in some cities, about families having multi-generational housing. And it's about parents moving in. Um, it's about, <laughs> sorry, about our kids moving back in. And uh, that, that's an aspect of this conversation that I think is really important. I also want to mention that the research, some of the research our planning department did showed that in cities that have approved ADUs um, wide, in a citywide manner and created financial incentives, which we're not talking about doing, have about one and a half percent of their housing stock after so many years um, that actually have ADUs. So it's a very, we see a very minimal impact on the housing stock, which I think is unfortunate. So I'm at, uh, I've got people wanting to vote, I suppose, on the substitute motion, which is to close the public hearing and defer this action to a future agenda. If you vote yay, we defer. If you vote nay, it bounces back to our original motion. Everybody clear? Oh, yeah, I'm going to roll call. Let's start with Charlie. Okay, we will. <laughs> Yeah, you can't do that, man. I'm the chair. <laughs> Charlie? Serious? Okay. We know what your vote is. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, vote against it because unless any of my colleagues are truly open-minded enough to consider oh, changing their votes, which it doesn't sound like they're going to. I was just going to our civility. Um, I, I don't see that there's really any reason to prolong it. I mean, if ever, I, it sounds to me, having gone through me, the, the discussions that we have, um, you're all as um, strong in your positions as I am in mine. And so for that reason, I don't think that there's really any reason to delay it. So I'll be voting against the substitute. <coughs> Councilmember Kitchen? Nay. Wharton? say for the same reasons that Charlie stated and I think there's a lot of wisdom in what what um, Cindy Cromer said that we can't take this long on every opportunity to move forward with affordable housing or we will never ever solve this crisis. Councilmember Johnston on your own motion? Yay. And Rogers? Yes. And it's uh, I'm a nay, so that takes us back to our original motion to close and approve tonight. And we'll roll call in the opposite direction this time. So, <laughs> Wait, can we? Can, can any we, discussion on this? If we might be moving tonight, then I want to make some comments like. Yes, like and that's, this is the time for that discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I have not been in the ADU debate for nine years, um, but I, uh, it, I know that it was something that was um, a big issue um, in the election last year, um, and, and District 3 is um, one of the exempt neighborhoods right now. And I will tell you that in walking the district and talking door to door with people, which I did five different times, um, there is a lot of support among um, our senior residents to be able to age in place. And I do think that people who have put money and time and their heart into a neighborhood and they want to stay in that neighborhood, they should have an option to be able to do so. I also think that the avenues um, and, and many of the other neighborhoods in District 3 are extremely um, cost prohibited for a lot of people, but they want to have the opportunity to live in a community like the avenues. It's a very special place and I don't, I don't blame anybody for wanting to be there. I think um, ADUs, regardless of whether they're technically affordable housing, um, 
they do have a net effect of driving down costs. They do make opportunity. They do create opportunities where there aren't any um, for students, for young professionals, um, for people that are maybe making lower, are working in lower wage jobs, uh, and they give those people an opportunity to to be in a neighborhood like the avenues where it's safe, where there are good schools, where there's a unique historic character. I think that we've gone through painstaking efforts to try to address all of the problems and I, I understand that, that the enforcement issue remains. But I would also point out that every other city that has addressed this issue has find, found a way to make it work and has found a way to deal with the enforcement issues um, in one way or another. I know that Salt Lake City is special, but we are not so special that we can't find a way to make this work. And I also think if enforcement becomes an issue, it's within the power of this body to divert more resources to in code enforcement. Um, I also think in, given the conditional use permit that that also gives us um, for, for specific neighborhoods like the, uh, historic districts, that this will help alleviate a lot of the problems that people have raised. Um, and so for those reasons, um, I'll be voting yes. Thank you, Councilmember Wharton. Any other discussion? Well, before Charlie's comment, I was going to thank every one of my peers for their civility in this discussion. <laughs> and I, I, aside from a few jabs, I said um, it with a smile. Really, yes. And I and I, I think I, Charlie, you and I, and Councilmember Rogers in particular have been here through a few iterations of this body, and uh, this is the first body that's been able to come to a vote. And I want to thank everybody for the blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into this. I think this was an appropriate uh, formal meeting <laughs> experience for this particular item and indicative or illustrative, rather, of the discussions we've had over the years. And um, lastly, I would say that what this means to me is about geographic equity in our city as it relates to housing. And that's something else this council has um, taken up and taken very seriously. And we've done that with our appropriation of millions of dollars from the RDA to areas of high opportunity in the city, trying to expand affo affordable housing into areas where we don't see it normally. And I think um, in many other ways, ADUs tonight and its citywide application is another step toward geographic equity that I want to thank each of you for being a part of. No matter how you vote, this is significant for our city tonight. Any discussion, Councilmember Rogers, were you? Okay. And so the vote is tonight on closing the public hearing and adopting Councilmember Rogers. Yes. Johnston? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Kitchen? Yes. I'm a yes. And Charlie? No. That passes five to one with Councilmember Fowler absent. Okay, with that we're going to move on to item five, which is our ordinance to update the major street plan of Salt Lake City Transportation Master Plan. I have some cards from Robert Goodman and Dave Iltis. Robert Goodman, you're up first on the major street plan, master plan. Hi, sorry, I got distracted. Let's, let's wait just 20... <laughs> 10 or 20 seconds for folks to move out of the room if they'd like to. Robert Goodman and Dave Iltis are the only cards I have on this item, so if you want to speak to it, let us know. We'll get you a card. All right, Mr. Goodman, you ready? Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you to uh, the council. Um, yeah, I reviewed the transit master plan. It looks uh, great. I would just like to... Uh, Speak in support of uh, uh, the clean air, uh, the free fare days that you had uh, last year to free fare day. Um, I think that was a great idea. That's something I've, I've been uh, kind of supporting for a very long time. I know that uh, other cities with air quality issues do something similar, and I think that's something that would be of benefit to uh, our city in the Wasatch Valley. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodman. Dave Iltis. This ordinance is uh, being considered as a reaction to the state's usurping of Salt Lake City's power 
and the Northwest Quadrant. Um, it's unfortunate that you have to do this. It's unfortunate that roads have to be developed in this area. Um, this is going to trash the Northwest West Quadrant. It's going to trash the environment. Um, I'm not sure whether you should vote yay or nay on this. Um, but one of the issues here is that nobody's minding the store in regards to one of the best bicycling routes in Salt Lake Valley, one of the most, the, probably the second most popular route in Salt Lake City, which is the Marina bicycle route along the frontage road. Um, there was some attention given to this when the prison was going in, but now that the inland port is going in, um, transportation is overwhelmed, and uh, I haven't been able to get an answer from them as to what is going on with that. Um, and so if you're going to vote for this or consider this, please add uh, language or intent language to preserve the character of the frontage road. And, and that doesn't just mean adding a bicycle path. It means preserving the character of that roadway, which is one of the best roadways for recreational riding in the valley because there's little traffic. Uh, and it's quiet, the speed limit is low, and the scenery is beautiful. And the, north, the inland port has the option, has, has the potential to destroy this completely. Um, there are two other streets that are within the inland port that I don't know that they, the major street plan applies to this, but 22nd West and then 400 South, 500 South, 700 South, that corridor that stretches from from uh, downtown all the way out to 5600 West. Those roadways are um, bike, bikeways. They're, they're um, good bikeway transportation, uh, part of the transportation network, and those need to be preserved as well. Time. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Iltis. That was the last card I have on this mass major street plan transportation update. Anyone else here to speak on that item? OK, I'll look for a motion. Madam Chair, I move the council continue the public hearing to the November 13th meeting. Second. Got a motion to continue this uh, to November 13th, a second by, uh, by Councilmember Johnston, a second by Councilmember Rogers. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And we'll continue that public hearing. Now we're on to item six, the public hearing for the public meeting. I'm sorry, it's not a public hearing, folks. It's a public meeting and comment um, regarding the streets reconstruction general obligation bond. This item is a opportunity to be heard regarding the streets reconstruction bond and is another state required step in the legal process that began when the council placed the bond on the ba November ballot. We'll begin by hearing from our city election officer, Cindy Mansell, who will read the arguments for and against the bond and the rebuttals and will follow her readings uh, by comments from anyone else who wishes to speak on the issue. Thank you, Ms. Mansell. Cake. So I'm going to start with the argument for the streets reconstruction bond, and it was provided by the Salt Lake City Council and Mayor. So this November, we are asking city voters to approve an 87 million streets reconstruction general obligation bond. Bonding is a common way local governments pay for expensive projects like road reconstruction and civic buildings. It's also one of the most accountable funding options available since state law requires the funds be spent only for the purpose outlined on the ballot. Salt Lake City is poised for continued prosperity, making now the time to take advantage of a rare and affordable funding option. This bond will invest in the street network, the backbone of our local econom economy, by reconstructing some of the worst roads. Many of our roads must be rebuilt. They are past the point of maintenance or repairs. A year ago, an in-depth pavement condition survey found nearly two-thirds of the city's streets are in poor or worse condition. Fortunately, the time is right to act and make a big impact on our street reconstruction needs with minimal impact to household budgets. Two current bonds for the new main library, 1999, and the Leonardo Museum Project, 2009, will be paid off in 2019. That gives voters the rare opportunity to approve a new bond for street reconstruction without significantly increasing property taxes overall. The owner of a home valued at a citywide average of $339,500 would see a net property tax increase of just zero to five dollars a year. Since bonds will be issued over several years, some property owners won't see any net impact at all. 
commercial property taxes are calculated differently, they would increase by $25.72 a year per $100,000 of taxable value. Not approving the bond would lower taxes on an average value home by about $41 a year, but our roads would continue their decline and cost even more in future years to rebuild. The upfront costs of street reconstruction projects are so high, the city can't save up enough to address them without cutting other critical services. Bond funds will be spent over several years to reconstruct the worst streets first. 80% of funding would go to major roads in the worst shape and 20% split among neighborhood streets in each city council district. Although the bond funds won't be sufficient to reconstruct all roads, we can make significant progress. Individual street selection will be based prim primarily on data from the pavement condition survey with consideration given to other factors like master plans and other projects. Given their importance in our daily lives and our economy, we have little choice but to repair our roads. Regardless of where in the city you live and whether you travel by foot, bike, or vehicle, we all use our streets and have a stake in ensuring they meet our needs. Invest in our future and don't let crumbling roads detour our city's success. Vote yes on the streets reconstruction bond. And so now I'll read the rebuttal to the argument in favor, and it was submitted by Salt Lake City resident Frank A. Langenrich. And he says, it is true that Salt Lake City streets need improvement, but not through this proposed bond. Since the argument for the bond states bond funds would be spent over several years, it is clear the projects do not have the funding urgency suggested in the proposal. A more responsible way to do this is to sideline less important budget items and make the necessary improvements over time. Because the bond funding would be designated strictly for road projects, it would provide the city with another excuse to divert its current road funding to other areas. An earlier $5 million property tax increase for road repairs was used for employee raises and said, see Salt Lake Tribune, February 2nd, 2017. Salt Lake City Council wants to pay for street improvements, but how? This year, we have already been saddled with a sales tax increase that was intended to be used partially for roads. The argument that this proposed bond would take the place of two other bonds scheduled to be paid off in 2019 suggests the attitude that bond funding may be treated as a permanent tax increase with ongoing renewals. There is no commitment to reducing the city's ongoing indebtedness or our tax burden. Since the argument in favor states that the bonds won't be sufficient to reconstruct all roads, we are already being prepped for additional requests. Vote no on the streets reconstruction bond. Then I have the argument against the streets reconstruction bond and that was submitted by Salt Lake City resident Frank A. Langenrich. While we agree that Salt Lake City needs road, road projects, this one is short-sighted and will cost much more in the long run as a haphazard small project approach. We believe the city needs to present a complete plan with full disclosure to the public for evaluation. This bond will merely lead to many more over the next decade as the city will repeatedly come back for additional piecemeal funding. There are a number of issues with the issuance and additional indebtedness proposed to be taken on by the citizens of Salt Lake City. While this bond issue will increase our general obligation debt by 64%, it is still insufficient to fund the needs claimed by the city. Consider that the 13th East project, budgeted at 14 million, is only 1.12 miles long, or 12.5 million per mile. At that rate, the bond would cover less than seven miles of street repairs. There is no comprehensive plan for the use of these funds. While the city has laid out an algorithm to choose which streets will receive reconstruction, the proposal is that the bonds will likely be used as projects are identified in several stages. The public should know the entirety of the project before voting on it. These bonds are budgeting sleight of hand. The city has consistently reduced parts of the capital budget since the end of the recession, including the amount budgeted for street reconstruction from 13.4 million in 2017 to a proposed 8.9 million in 2019. The contribution of general fund dollars to the capital improvement program has declined 3.8% from fiscal year 2016 through fiscal year 2018. While sales tax were just increased by 33 million per year, only 4 million of this is being allocated to street reconstruction. The city is reallocating necessary budgets and then making it up by asking us to cover 87 million to cover priorities. The city has not upheld the commitments made to voters on past bond obligations. For instance, when the bonds for our basketball arena were paid, it was expected that property taxes would be reduced to reflect the lower debt service. Instead, those funds were redirected to fund the new theater downtown. In this way, city leaders maintained the debt and built the theater without public approval. We expect that if these bonds are approved, we will owe these funds forever as one project after another receives rollover after rollover without public approval. 
do not believe the promised 10-year term. For all these reasons, vote no on the street reconstruction bonds. Make the city deal honestly with its citizens. And then finally, I have the rebuttal to the argument against the street's reconstruction bond provided by the city council and mayor. The argument against the bond does not match the facts and data publicly available from the city. The city increased ongoing funding to the capital improvement program by 19.5% over the past four years and honored projects funded by past general obligation bonds, which are legally bonding voter decided funding tools. Current and future city leaders legally can't spend this bond funding on anything but streets reconstruction as specified on the ballot. What's more, the city does have a comprehensive plan. The city's 2017 pavement condition report identified the lowest rated roads needing reconstruction. 69.6 million of the bond would be allocated for major roads and 17.4 million for local streets throughout the city. The bond is based on a plan prioritizing data-driven selection. While the bond won't solve every road need citywide, it will address about 20% of the most critical, a significant improvement drivers all over the city would benefit from. Currently, full road reconstruction averages a cost of $500,000 per lane mile for asphalt. Maintaining roads costs much less, between $9,000 and $14,000 per lane mile. So the city allocated several million dollars from ongoing city funds, not bonds, to expand maintenance crews and keep our roads from declining to this point again. If the bond passes, the city will be using 11.4% of the general obligation bond credit card debt limit. The city arrived here through a transparent process consisting of 15 open houses, 13 public briefings, two public hearings, and one citywide mailing. Thank you, Ms. Mansell. Uh, now we'll hear from the public, and Dan Curtis has been patiently waiting. <laughs> I've still got your card. Dan, you'll come up first, followed by Nancy Saxton. Okay, thank you for hearing me. It's been a little while. Uh, my name is Dan Curtis. I live at 1032 East 400 South for the past seven years. I've been commuting up to the University of Utah by my bike about two times every day, you know, five days a week, most of the year. Um, in that time, I've been hit by a car one time with I don't know how many other close calls. This is primarily at the intersection of 4 South and 13th East. Um, I think it's mostly like the design of the intersection. Cars come around that right-hand corner on the 4 South, and people just get hit all the time. Um, I think there was some, there were some previous ordinances where that bike lane that was there was being built where it was being more protected, and I felt like a lot of those accidents would be prevented if that was fully carried out. So I think my main concern about this bond is that it wouldn't fully address the ordinances regarding the complete streets. Um, and I would really like, I'm not entirely sure what the response to that is, if it's more legislation or amendments or something else, but to make sure that those complete streets are more built into the process and make sure that there's more accountability um, and they're carried out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. Uh, Nancy Saxton is up next, followed by George Chapman. Welcome back, Ms. Saxton. Thank you, Thank you Council. Um, I, have a, I have a thought that I hope will perhaps be a suggestion about the bond process. Um, it seems to me that since we're using public money, and I'm glad to hear that there is a for and against, that I would like to see that there is matching money for the entities that speak against a bond, since it's public money. So um, that getting the word out, um, which I thought there was some very good information on both sides, but I think often when there is a bond issue, um, it's a bit uh, quiet on the, um, to, to be able to publicly go out and let people know what ideas may be against the bond. I think that we live in a time where transparency is um, hoped for and valued and yet doesn't really exist and this might be a nice um, step for the city to set the stage um, for the world in many ways to really allow the public to make use of their own, their, their own individual tax dollars to speak out about bonds that are going to, that is going to um, affect each household. So I'd like for you to think about that for transparency so that each voter can be completely um, educated about the issues on both sides. Thank you, Ms. Saxton. George Chapman is the last card that I have, and I think George left. So there's one more. Great, Dave Iltis. 
My name is Dave Eltis with Cycling Utah. Um, I'm for the bond. I, I think that it's a, a necessary thing. Um, but I'm only for it if you amend and drastically improve the Complete Streets Ordinance. I know you've had some discussions about doing this. Um, the ordinance as it currently sits is uh, uh, ignored by Salt Lake City um, in multiple places. Um, First South is an example where First South was repaved and under the last administration and bike lanes were not put in. Um, there's plenty of room there to do that. 700 South, same thing, bike lanes. There's room to actually go in tomorrow and stripe bike lanes on there. Um, when they repaved this the last time, it wasn't included. Uh, 21st South is, of course, probably the, the most glaring example um, where shortly after not including new bike lanes on there um, and, and better sidewalks and better uh, crosswalks, a teenager was hit and had broke both of his legs broken there. Um, so if you're going to spend $87 million on streets, please have a plan for this. Please make sure that this modernizes Salt Lake City's transportation. You cannot do the same thing over and over and over again and expect that we're going to have anything but air pollution and traffic and sprawl. Um, the Complete Streets Ordinance, again, it, it needs to apply when you do some things simply like um, you know, chip sealing a roadway and if there's room to put bike lanes on there or improve pedestrian access uh, or make it easier for bulb outs for transit, um, those sorts of things need to be done. And to just spend 87 million without having this um, and, and have a, a carte blanche ticket to do this without a good plan, uh, I don't think is wise governance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Iltis. That's the last card I have tonight on this item. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to us? Then I'll look for a motion on the public comment. Madam Chair, I move the council close the public meeting and comment for the streets reconstruction general obligation bond. Second. We've got a motion by Councilmember Rogers, a second by Councilmember Kitchen. Is there any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that takes us on to Section C, our potential action items. Item one is a resolution for the proposed amendment to the interlocal agreement with Salt Lake County regarding the 10th East Senior Center. Madam Chair, I move the Council adopt the resolution that authorizes approval of the First Amendment to the Interlocal Cooperation Agreement and authorizes execution of the amendment. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Rogers and a second by Councilmember Johnston. Any discussion on this motion? No? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. Item two is an ordinance for budget amendment number one for fiscal year 2018-19. I'll look for a motion. Madam Chair, I move that the Council adopt an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2018-19 budget as proposed by the administration except for item A3 with the changes shown on the motion sheet. Would you like me to go through those, those items on the motion sheet? Great. Second. Uh, motion by Councilmember Rogers, second by Councilmember Johnston. Any discussion on this, BAM? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We passed that one. We're on to item three, which is the ordinance for property clearing and weed control amendments. It's back. Amend amended. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move the council adopt an ordinance amending sections of city code pertaining to collection of abatement costs, weed control, and clearing of real property. And I further move the changes outlined in the staff report dated October 16 pertaining to low growing weeds such as puncture vine be included in the final draft. Second. Second. I have a motion by Council Member Kitchen, a second by Council Member Johnston. Any discussion? Nothing sticking in your side that you need to say <laughs> about this one? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's getting late. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Sorry. That takes us to more comments to the council. First is questions to the mayor from the city council. And tonight we have our wonderful guests of David Litback and Patrick Cleary. Thank you for being here, fellas. 
Any questions? Did you adopt a dog or a cat in the hallway today? I, I did not. I don't think David did, but Mr. Rojas adopted the cat. So. What about you, Madam Chair? I tried, but Kyle said no. That's a good thing I wasn't I want that there. on the public record. <laughs> I think we should vote to admonish Kyle. <laughs> Any other questions? For the I was going to ask if there are four against puncture vines. But. I will just like to note that tomorrow is the uh, opening game for the Utah Jazz regular season. So, thanks. Wow. Okay. We're moving on to comments to the city council. So if you're here to give us comments on anything else. Now's your time. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, let's move on to E, new business of which there's none, unfinished business. We have the compensation plan amendments for fiscal year 2018-19. Madam sure. Chair. I move that council approve an ordinance amending uh, fiscal year 2019 annual compensation plan for non-represented employees of Salt Lake City Corporation. Second. Okay, I've got a motion by Councilmember Wharton, and a second by Councilmember Rogers. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Now we're on the consent agenda. Move for approval. Actually, I need you to poll. <gasps> Remember? Item G2. Yes. Do you want to restate? I move for approval with the exception of item G2. Second. Got a motion by Councilmember Kitchen, a second by Councilmember Luke. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And all the puppies and kittens and rabbits are safe. And that's it for tonight, well, folks. Except for one, thanks to Kyle. <laughs> <laughs>